Welcome to Bookview TV. I'm Dennis Campbell. Now, this is a show where we talk about books. We talk with their authors and at length, and this week we have a very special book and guest. From Don't Ask, Don't Tell to 37 U.S. states doing their level best to constitutionally ban same-sex marriage, being a gay soldier in the U.S. has been filled with huge obstacles. And the question I've asked for decades is what difference does it make who someone chooses to spend the rest of their life with, especially in the military, where the only thing anyone should care about is whether or not they can hold the correct end of a gun and, quote, have their fellow soldiers back, close quote. And why are there so many homophobic bigots intent on denying these men and women the rights and benefits of others in the heterosexual community? Well, for a long time, it was the courage of a soldier on this side of the pond who worked inside the military establishment to help everyone understand how difficult life is for members of the LGBT community who have but one wish, to serve their nation, in this case our queen, and at the end of the day, be allowed to go home to and be with the person they love. Now, this week's guest has written an amazing book on the subject. James Wharton is the author of Out in the Army, My Life as a Gay Soldier. Now, truth be told, I often have to speed skim through books on the show because of our pressurized weekly format. This book, though, was so grippingly powerful it grabbed and held me cover to cover. Now, James Wharton was destined to be a soldier. He started at age 13 as a cadet near the North Wales town of Wrexham and quite literally grew up in the army living in a conservative and cloistered community and then joining an army that initially was not at all receptive to anyone who was gay, that had to be difficult. Well, he's overcome all obstacles with distinction and joins us today from his home near London in the city of Windsor to talk about the book and his life. James Wharton, it's a privilege to welcome you to Bookview TV. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted. Now, James, it was my wife who actually found you on the Daily Bacon podcast from BBC Five Live. And there's a lot of ground here to cover because it's such an important global topic right now with the marriage debate in the U.S. and the recent repeal of DADT. Now, back in the beginning days when your first platoon sergeant laid out a few ground rules, he said, quote, be on time, have the correct equipment, don't bully anyone, and don't come out if you're a fag. I can't stand faggots, close quote. Now, as a gay soldier and as a man, how did that make you feel? Well, it was one of those really awkward situations, as you can imagine. I was about four hours into my career at that time. It was basic training. It was day one. I just said goodbye to my mother, which was traumatic in, in, in itself. And, and there we go. And that was the very sort of first introduction I had to what kind of environment the Army was in 2003. Uh, and it was a bit traumatic, but at that point it was too late to do anything about it. I was already there, I was, I was ready to become a soldier. And if I'm honest, I, um, I just thought, well, that's, that's it, gay people aren't accepted in the military. But that wasn't going to stop me from being a soldier. And I continued on through basic training in, in the mindset that perhaps my sexuality might just be a phase. And I think that's quite normal for 16 year olds to consider. Uh, but of course, it, that would turn out to be not the case. Um, but but that, by, by that point, I was already there, and uh, it was just this strange moment of actually coming face to face with intolerance. Now, much later in the book, indeed, after you'd finished it, you went back to that platoon sergeant from 10 years ago, and you know, he revealed this to you, which I thought was very telling. He said, quote, in my nearly 40 years of living, I've done things and said things that I now reflect on, I think I would have done or said things differently. I'm roughly 15 years older than you and joined the army when you would have been a baby. Things were a lot different then. The army and world in general was a lot more conservative in regards to lots of things, not just homosexuality, but generally anything that wasn't the norm. And I found out in the last eight years since leaving the army that there's life outside of the regiment and everything you've told is not always the truth. The statement I made upon reflection was a statement I would definitely change, close quote. That's such a huge admission, James. How much has things, how much have things changed in the army and how did that make you feel? Well, you know, to just talk about what, what that letter meant to me, <coughs> excuse me, that platoon sergeant and I exchanged some messages just recently about that very early, um, that recollection that we just spoke about where, where I was brought face to face with homophobia. And the thing about it was that was three years after the law had changed. And in his circumstance, he joined the army at the end of the 1980s and was told that if you ever suspect anybody's gay, a fellow soldier, you have a duty to report them because being, kept, being gay 
is not okay within the military. And if I just put myself in his position, when I joined the army at 16 and I was taught how to use a weapon and how to march correctly, those, um, those rules and, and those lessons were drilled into me again and again and again until it became just um, so natural to, to follow instructions. So when he was told in 1989, always report someone who's gay, they have a, they, you have a duty to do that. He, he, up until 2003, when he made those comments, he, he still thought that that was an okay thing to, to do and, uh, and, it, and it was okay to be homophobic. And I do blame the army for it. Uh, I was glad to, to have that letter off him saying that he looks back upon that and, and, and thinks that it was a wrong thing to say and, he, and he's now quite different in, in life. And I, and I thought that spoke volumes to this change from the military of the 80s and 90s to the military of today. 2013. He's no longer a soldier. He's he's left the army and gone away, and had his own had his own family and his own life since. And uh, and that's why I felt so I wanted to put it in the book. But I'd finished writing the book by the time that letter came, so I added it as an author's note at the end. Well, you know, it's it's so, so interesting because you know you had in the U.S. the the don't ask, don't tell policy for so long, and indeed. Your answer to a, a visiting group of military people from the United States uh, was quite pivotal, perhaps, in ending the program. You became a key figure in all of it. Now, you talked about an interview that they conducted about your experience, and um, they asked a very important question. I'd love if you could take a second and actually read from the book your answer to their question. Uh, do you mean being gay made you a better soldier? Yeah, that's right. And it was a watershed moment where I think uh, they were expecting a very, very complex set of answers from me. Um, and I said, no, that's not what I mean at all. I mean being able to be gay and, be, and being able to say without any fear that I was gay helped me serve better. It made me more operationally effective. If I'd have had the constant worry that I, that I could be outed at any point, or that some suspicious police officer could read through my letters to find I was secretly hiding away a boyfriend, other people's lives would have been in danger. I'd have spent more time worrying about my fate and being outed than worrying about being shot or blown up, and that could have cost lives. Wow. I, I mean, that's that's just incredibly powerful to, to think about because I mean, from 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 our perspective, you know, you just think of it as being a, a, a just a really a stupid ban on, on the ability to serve, but not understanding what people were going through. Tell me a little bit about, you know, you were in Iraq and there was a U.S. radio tech there by the name of Sammy. Um, and it looked like there was some sparks between the two of you that might have gone somewhere. Might things have gone differently for both of you without DADT, don't ask, don't tell, or if he was allowed to be openly gay and in the military back then? Um, it's not, I, I can't even imagine what could have possibly happened, but yeah, if he would have been able to say, oh, I'm gay too, it's nice to meet you, and then we'd have had our flirtatious conversations, which we kind of did anyway, but we had to do them in code in a way, and we had to, you know, it was very, it was very difficult for Sammy to to even say the words, I'm gay, because just by saying them words, he was breaking that rule of don't ask, don't tell, which for him was, you know, incredibly heavy on his shoulders. I think certainly if he would have been able to just say, quite frankly, like I did to him, yes, I'm gay, we'd have had um, a fantastic conversation, many conversations, and who knows? Now, there, despite the law change here in the United Kingdom banning the exclusion of gay soldiers in about 2000, there was a period, even in 2003, 2004 and, and beyond, where you underwent significant harassment and indeed you suffered a very brutal beating at the hands of a fellow soldier. Talk a bit about that experience. It's interesting that I always talk about this two-generational thing within the army. Those soldiers like my platoon sergeant who joined the army before the year 2000 and then soldiers like me who joined in the early 2000s. Um, and I always say that this, the latter generation, my generation, are very forward-moving, very liberal. And that generation, as the platoon sergeant said in his letter, is a more conservative, um, more masculine environment within the military. But when I got attacked in 2005 in London at my, at my barracks, it was from someone of my own generation, one of my own contemporaries who, who put me into that hospital, um, hospitalised state. 
Now, at first, and the military investigation certainly considered that it was a sort of honeypot attack where I was tricked into going back to his room with him under the pretense of something, of something else. And then actually I got beaten up by, by Mal Bar. And, um, but what came out in the, in the weeks and months that followed, he was court-martialed, which was a good thing, but he was allowed to remain in the military, which I found quite difficult to deal with. But three or four weeks later, I was in a nightclub in London in Soho with some friends and we bumped into this person who was at the time kissing another man and then I thought to myself this has all happened because he's so insecure with his own sexuality and the uh, the outspilling of which resulted in me ending up in hospital and I just thought that was really sad you know now you were also threatened by a soldier when under the command of a certain member of the royal family Lieutenant Wales. Others would know of him as third in line to the throne, Prince Harry. When we come back on Bookview TV for part two here with James Wharton, we'll dive deeper into the relationship he had with Prince Harry and what, what it was like growing up in North Wales as a young gay man when Bookview TV continues with our visit with the author of Out in the Army, My Life as a Gay Soldier. Stay right here. <laughs> 